Hey everyone, and welcome to Biblical Bites. I'm Adam, and I'm excited to be your host alongside my co-host, Allison. Hi everyone, I'm Allison, and I couldn't agree with you more, Adam. Our goal is to bring the Bible to life in a fresh and relevant way, and to tackle everything and anything dealing with the church and the Bible today. So grab your Bible and your headphones and join us as we dive into the rich pages of Scripture, exploring its timeless truths and wisdom. And in the process, we'll help fight against biblical illiteracy, empowering you to live out your faith with confidence and understanding. So let's journey together and deepen our knowledge and understanding of the Word of God. This is Biblical Bites. Good afternoon, Adam. How's it going? Uh, it is a good afternoon. It's a beautiful day outside, and I've actually been outside for I a I was about of to day. say, you say that a lot, and then you tell me you haven't been outside. I know. <laughs> I usually am just looking out- outside, and uh, this morning I spent... Uh, quite a bit of it outside. It's a beautiful morning. Yeah, it's a good how's, day. How's your day going? It's going really well. I, I slept in a little bit today. Yes. It's summer here for us. In we are Texas. on summer schedule now. Yeah. So that was kind of nice. Yeah. But after we taped last week, I found out something really interesting. And I just thought that I needed to give you a little extra accolade <laughs> last week um, when we taped. I found out that all of your coworkers yes. were walking past this window that we have in the room that we're taping in, which is actually behind my bat. Yes. So yes. unbeknownst to me, they were making faces at you. <laughs> There's a long hallway directly in front of me, but behind uh, her, that as she's taping and as we're discussing, if you really pay attention, you may even catch me pausing for a moment in the middle of speaking because all of them decided they thought it would be funny if they walk down the halls and make funny faces at me and... <laughs> And, you know, try to get me to break. Yeah, but it did not work. The minute we finished taping and hit in, they burst in. <laughs> yes. Burst in the room and, and confessed to me. And But I was I was just very impressed with you because I did not know. <laughs> good, good. And, and, I, and actually, it kind of ties into me, to the book of Esther. I mean, all this was going on behind me. <laughs> and you had and no I clue. had no idea what was yes. all going on. And there's so many things going on in the book of Esther so unseen to our eyes. My question is, do you sit at home all day and just think, like, how can I brilliantly tie in the most abstract illustration <laughs> back into this book that we that are That was studying? actually totally off the cuff. Oh, I just really amazing. started this conversation to really, I mean, actually compliment you because I know I could not have done that. <laughs> well, these alley-isms never stop. Alleyisms never, ever stop. So. <laughs> Uh, yes, that's my theater background too, by the way. I can I, tell. Yes, learning how not to break character. So I guess I stayed in character I, well. I'm this time. truly impressed. Speaking of characters, we are almost done. This is this is like our big big finale mm-hmm. finish of uh, of this book that we've been going through for quite a while, eight weeks now. Yeah, I can't believe that's flown by. And we actually uh, were almost, let's see, by the time this comes out, we'll be in episode 21, I think, oh. of our podcast. So we're 21 episodes in. Can you believe that? So does that make us almost experts? I don't know. Almost. <laughs> almost. <laughs> almost. Maybe, maybe 21 more in will okay. we'll be good. So. Okay. Um, but uh, we're glad that you're here listening. If you're here, part of this, um, we are finishing up on our Esther uh, study and uh, what are some key takeaways if we're just if someone just happened to be for some reason jumping into the middle of this or the end of this entire study what do you think are some key takeaways yeah probably uh, the first you? key takeaway would be go visit our podcast and yeah. <laughs> listen to sessions yeah. one through eight because <laughs> yeah. there's lots of good things there in God's word that I don't want you to miss but yeah. um so in such broad terms I guess to bring people up to speed um we introduced I think in the last episode or maybe the one before that that this book is written in a chiastic structure yeah. so how it begins is how it ends yeah. um in a chiastic structure and really the point of a chiastic structure is to focus us on that middle yeah. hinge point And we saw in chapter six that um, leading up to chapter six, we have a queen who has gotten banished and Mm. no longer queen, making a way for Esther, who is God's girl. Um, And he puts her in the position of queen um, for such a time as an edict that was written to annihilate, kill and destroy all of the Jewish people. And um, Esther is in a position where she can use 10 seconds of courage yeah. to use an atomism. Yes. <laughs> and um, she takes that 10 seconds of courage to go to the king and make him aware of the edict. And he gives her permission to not reverse it so much because you can't revoke it, but to um, write another edict that kind of overarches and gives the Jews the right to defend themselves. Mm. And so... Um, what was meant to harm Esther and the Jewish people, God uses 
um, for their good yeah. and for their strengthening. And we see that um, corporately among the Jewish people coming together. But we also see that personally because that's how God always works. Yeah. Um, he has personal meaning and corporate meaning when he calls us to do things. And so personally for Esther and Mordecai, her father figure, um, they raise up to embrace who God's called them to be. Hmm. And it was a dangerous and difficult calling, um, but he gave them the courage to do what he asked them to do. And so now we kind of get to tie up this book, um, and we see that in a book that doesn't name God, God's hand is all over it. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, that's one of the biggest themes there is that this is one of the books that's set aside or set apart from the rest of the Old Testament um, books that it doesn't mention God one time, and it's deceiving kind of where it's led, where it's laid out um, within our English um, organization of the Bible. But if you were to lay it out chronologically, Esther would would take place basically um, as the last thing written. Um, previous to when Jesus will come on the scene in the New Testament. So there's about to be um, in a chronological, a literal chronological timeline, there's about to be a big um, uh, amount of time, a large period of time of 400 years of what will see, what will be seemed as silence um, from God. There won't be new writings, that kind of thing that will um, become canon until uh, Jesus will step for, step forward. So I think when you look at that, we are a hundred years removed from the Babylonian exile. Um, there's been decrees in the books previous to the, to this one, um, and and Ezra and Nehemiah that some of the Jews can go back from from their Persian at this point Persian captivity, and um, some do. And um, so now what happens is we're in a in, we're still in that thematic uh, wrong land. They're not supposed to be here, but yet. Um, even in the midst of this wrong land, we're going to see how God is obviously orchestrating and, and working throughout um, these people, people's lives, um, undeniably so, um, even when he's never mentioned. Mm -hmm. And so if you're an ancient uh, Israelite, ancient Jew, and you're reading this, 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 this will be a, during those times of silence, this is a, a beautiful picture of how, um, one, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, we're seeing a lot of the repeating th themes that we've tied to earlier elements of the story uh, or of the of history, like uh, the Joseph story and these kind of things. Um, so we're on repeat there, but yet there's still going to be um, this this element of well, what what do we see God doing even when He's not necessarily outwardly mentioned in this book, and um, He never quits working, like He's working through it all. And I think for me, that's a that's a big. A big thing to look for in this book and, yeah. and and honestly the rest of scripture yeah one of the things i don't think we've mentioned in this podcast is that um jews often to this day refer to this book as the megillah the that's megillah what, the megillah that's what this book is called and um we actually have a version of that word we mm. took that word uh, that hebrew word and we made an english idiom out of it mm. you may have heard it said the whole megillah the whole Megillah. Uh, have you ever heard I that? I have never heard that before. So yeah. I'm sure some of our listeners have. Like it, it's it's like a long, complicated story or a long, complicated process or, or mess. Yeah. Really, like it might be. It might say something like, um, "The accountant went through all the books. He went through the whole Megillah." Oh, <laughs> like, okay. And so it's you know it's like the whole nine yards. Okay. Kind of would be another way to say it. And um, I think it's really cool that. Um, we have taken that word and we use it a lot more playfully, I yeah. think, than the book of Esther is a pretty serious book with a lot of serious um, actions and a lot of serious implications yeah. to those actions. But we use it kind of in a playful way when we say it as an idiom most of the time in the English language. Um, but what underlie what's consistent, I think, in the way that the book of Esther is referred to and in our English idiom is that it's a big mess, you know, yeah. big mess. And, and guess who is? in the mess. Mm. God. God is in yeah, the whole God time. is in the mess the whole time and God gets the last word. Mm. And um and we're going to see that today. Yeah. Um and you know I, I thought about that idiom and I thought about the book of Esther and sometimes my life seems like a whole magilla, yeah. whole mess, you know, and it's a reminder that um God is always in our mess mm. and God always gets the last word of every complicated story. Very cool. So we are going to be in chapter nine, and actually we're going to go ahead and um, tie this episode up with a bow by including chapter ten. Yeah. Um, and just as a fair warning, there's a big, there's a large portion of chapter nine that deals um, with um, the historical nature of a, of an ancient Jewish feast, um, which will kind of 
tap, um, you know, we'll kind of talk about just slightly, but um, we're not going to go into great detail as far as what that goes. Um, but we're going to really deal with the narrative elements of the first opening parts of chapter nine, I think, um, will be the best way to do this. And then we'll wrap it up with chapter 10. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. So how about I start by reading the first 10 verses of chapter nine? Yep, that would be great. It has some big names, so wish me luck. Yes, this is going to be fun. I'm, I'm going to take take note here. Okay. Now in the 12th month, that is the month Adar, and on the 13th day when the king's command and edict were about to be executed on the day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, it was turned to the contrary so that the Jews themselves gained the mastery over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities throughout all of the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm, and no one could stand before them, for the dread of them had fallen on all the peoples. Even all the princes of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and those who were doing the king's business assisted the Jews, because the dread of Mordecai had fallen on them. Indeed, Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces, for the man Mordecai became greater and greater. Thus, the Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying, and they did what they pleased to those who hated them. And in Susa, the capital, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men, and Parshadatha, Dalphon, Aspatha, Paratha, Adalia, Eridatha, Parmashta, Arasai, Ardai, and Vyasatha. The ten sons of Haman, the sons of Hamadatha, the Jews' enemy, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Mm. Wow, you did a brilliant job. I don't know. My I just mouth, kind of made up some things as I went. My mouth was struggling just following along <laughs> silently. So um, this is a very confusing um, sort of what feels like, um, I don't know, it's sort of for me when I read this the first time, it, it, it kind of plays with your emotions a little bit because the instinct is to, you know, celebrate mm -hmm. like, oh, good. The overturning potential ruining of, of the Jewish people they're going to, and the bad people are going to get what they deserve, you know, death and, and destruction. Um, but for me, I felt very conflicted reading this because while my instinct is to celebrate, there's still um, a, a, a large scale loss of life that's mm -hmm. taking place. And I think this is um, really going to tie into sort of what we, what we feel, uh, you know, um, will leave us, uh, you know, when we get to chapter 10, especially that there's this big like question mark of, um, yes, this got fixed, but on the other hand, it doesn't feel like final. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't feel like it, it, it feels like there, there's a lot of questions, a lot of, um, moral ambiguities, um, that take place because what we would label as the, um, as good people in this book, as far as Esther and Mordecai and the ones who are faithful, faithful to God, um, there's still a lot of question mark, um, uh, moral um, drinking and sex and murder and violations of these different commands and things that take place. And then it still ends in a bunch of people um, dying, not just in a moment of um, like pure uh, survival, I should say, like not just when they're being attacked, but also ex extends into a, a second day and then uh, a taking of um, the 10 sons of, of Haman as well. And so you're just kind of left, at least I was, left with this just real icky feeling of, yay, good, but man, I feel like there could have been a better way to fix all of this, maybe even from the start. Yeah. Which I think is maybe the, the correct way that you're supposed to read this, because, you know, at the end of the day, you're celebrating um, uh, God's faithfulness to his people, um, but you're left going, but there's still problems here. There's yes. still major problems here. Well, and I think this is a good example of one of those times when God's word is descriptive, but mm -hmm. not necessarily prescriptive. Yeah. And we touched on that a little bit, I think, in our biblical literacy episode. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes when we read God's word, it's reporting to us the yeah. events that happened. It's not prescribing to us yeah. ways that God thinks we ought to act. Um, and so we're not really sure based on the text here if um, God was approving, um, yeah. you know, of this slaughter. So we can't necessarily assign prescriptive meaning yeah. to their actions um, because God's silent on that, isn't yeah. he? So we have to look for um, things we can be sure about, things that um, this does teach us about God. Mm. 
And I think one of those things that this does teach us about God and, and about his character can really be clearly seen if we look at the original language in verse 1. Mm. Um, it says, and this is probably just one of the best phrases um, in the book of Esther there in chapter 9, verse 1. It says um, in the second part of that verse, On the day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, it was turned to the contrary so that the Jews gained the mastery over those who hated them. Mm. So that's kind of almost a synopsis, right, yeah, of the right. book of Esther in a phrase. But if we look at the original language of that verb, um, and it's translated in different translations a little bit differently, but here it's translated turn to the contrary. Mm. Or I think in my CSB Bible, it's um, translated just the opposite happened. Yeah. Um, so that the tables were turned, I think is another way I've seen it. But in the original language, that is a verb and a conjunction. Mm -hmm. um, and the verb is, um, in the Hebrew language, we call it nafal, mm -hmm. nafal conjunction of the verb. And that really just means the passive mm -hmm. voice of the verb. So if I've already lost you, don't stress. You learned about passive verb yeah. tenses when you were in elementary school. You've just forgotten. It's when the action happens to the subject. So the subject doesn't do the action. The subject is acted upon. For example... Um, I would be a difference in me saying I celebrated my birthday or I was celebrated okay. on my birthday. Someone else did the celebrating on my behalf. Yeah. So this verb, um, turn to the contrary, is the phrase used in the English Bible. Someone else did the turning. Mm. The turning was acted upon. The people were acted upon. And we know who that someone was. Yeah. God did the turning. Yeah. God turned the tables is really how it ought to literally read yeah. and then the cool thing about the conjunction so it's in the passive voice but there's a conjunction after the verb that's in the um, absolute infinitive tense mm -hmm. those are two big words but yes, it just are. means think about it absolutely and infinitely infinitely yeah. so ultimately and continuously and so i think this is a statement about the character of god you know what god does to his enemies and to the enemies of his people he absolutely and continuously turns the tables. Yeah. He gets the last word every single time. And that speaks to his sovereignty, which is a major theme in the book of Esther. Yeah. And actually it's a it's a macro picture of the micro what happened with Haman. He builds he builds the gallow, the stake, and he will be the one who will actively be, you know, um, placed upon it. Uh, he he was handed over to what he thought was right in his eyes mm -hmm. and ultimately it, it's not that the jews would go out and try to destroy a bunch of people group like the gentiles in fact the bible goes very specifically out of the way to not say they went out and just destroyed a bunch of just non-jewish people but the enemies of the jews specifically and so the ones through whom would enact their own judgment um and and what they felt was right in their own eyes got enacted upon them um the very thing that they were going to bring out themselves yeah um, and so, yeah, that was a very nerdy. And that's nerdy, actually a message. Beautiful way to say that. That's a message consistent with other parts of yeah. God's word when you're talking about um, giving over to the things he built for himself. Because mm -hmm. I feel like we've had the same conversation when we were talking about the unmerciful servant yeah. in the passage or in the episodes about the parables. Yeah. I mean, the unmerciful servant, we realized that the servant who wasn't, or the, excuse me, the unmerciful master, right? Yes. It was the servant. I said that wrong. Um, the the master didn't have mercy on that servant in right. that parable, and um, he ended up kind of not receiving mercy because that was the game he played. Yeah. He didn't want to deal with mercy. Yes. And so what he didn't give, he didn't receive. And um, we see some of that same idea playing out here in the Old Testament. Yeah, we we touched on it a couple episodes ago too, with regards to like um, this is a this is a theme that was going to come over and over, like with regards to the Pharaoh and uh, Pharaoh during the exile or the Exodus story narrative where he begins by trying to kill the baby Jews, but then he, the thing will be, he'll be handed over to his hardened heart and mm -hmm. ultimately lose his life as well. At the end of it, this happens at Babel, you know, the people are come together lest they get spread across the earth and God hands them over to the mm -hmm. destruction. Now the ones who want to come and steal, kill and destroy, um, are going to be handed over to, um, not stealing actually <laughs> that's an interesting change there but uh to be killed and destroyed themselves um but there's a there's also a, a slight um difference because the bible is really great about um telling like th like utter destructive numbers like so they'll say something like in first kings it'll talk about um the uh king uh abihu or however you say his name uh would kill like fifty thousand, you know people here the number 500 is going to feel a lot less than 
50,000 um, in, in a way. Um, and so it will be lessened there. But I think as, as a reader, because you've looked at this narrative through the lens of things that have happened before, there's still going to be a big question mark. Um, and the reason being is when you look at the Joseph narrative, which we've alluded to several times throughout this, um, very, very similar narrative as far as um, someone out of their control is going to be elevated all the way up to the second in command just by through, th- through being faithful um, uh, to God. Uh, you see the same thing with Esther. Well, at the end of the Joseph narrative, it he'll he'll hit us with that like real famous line that what you meant for evil god did for good he did this to save the lives of many and the way that the the language will say is like the whole world came to joseph because of their seven years of 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 plenty and because he is he was faithful to following what god would say the whole world would come to them for salvation here you're going to watch the whole um jewish nation will find safety and found, find salvation but it's still at the cost of of the loss of major life so there's that inversion of where god is faithful even um when we don't realize he's the one who's being faithful but you're still left going man things are still out of control here in this world where the beast has um like figuratively taken over and, and is in control what Paul would consider the powers of darkness, the rulers and authorities of this of this world. So we've got the beast who's in control. We're trying to do our best to be faithful, and God will will hand people over to their to the destructive ways that they bring on. Um, but it's still not quite right. Like mm-hmm. still not quite right. Um, and I think that's an interesting uh, element to the all the fun names here. Yeah. So. You know, some of the um, names of Haman's sons um, actually are reminiscent of like Persian demons Mm -hmm. or Persian gods. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that just brings in another element, you know, of spiritual warfare there in in the names of his sons. Yeah, we uh, in fact, we should uh, keep that in the back of your mind because we're going to do at least a short excerpt uh, episode of how this book may work symbolically as well. So that might be helpful towards that. Yeah. towards that a little bit. And the other thing I think that God's word does a good job of pointing out in verse 10 and then um, actually in verse 15 and 16 as well, it mentions that while the Jews did defend themselves and kill many of their enemies, they did not plunder. plunder. They did not, they plunder. Did not yeah. steal. Yep. And so um, I think the reason that that's important is it's an echo to um, what they should have done um, in first Samuel, yeah. um, because plunder was the problem in first Samuel, God told Saul to go and blot out the Amalekites. Yeah. And we know that Haman was a descendant of the Amalekites. And so, um, we, we can see in first Samuel that Saul didn't obey that, that rule, that yeah. law, that command, um, because Samuel, the prophet realized right away that Saul had disobeyed and saved King Agag who um, is actually Haman the Agagite. So we know that he was a direct descendant of of some of the Amalekites that Saul did save um, despite God's command to blot them out. And and they weren't to take any plunder. And they did. They did take plunder in 1 Samuel. So it was almost like um, the text is is really intentionally saying, but this time they 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 didn't do it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, they were trying to obey this time and not taking the plunder, trying to make right. Yeah. what they had had done wrong in the past yeah what do you say we read uh uh starting in verse 11 and we just finish up through 19 yeah i think you should have to read this okay time. i'll give it a shot all right starting in verse 11 that very day the number of those killed in susa the citadel was reported to to the king and the king said to queen esther in susa the citadel the jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and also the 10 sons of haman what have what then have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your wish? It shall be granted to you. And what further is your request? It shall be fulfilled. And Esther said, If it please the king, let the Jew who is in Susa be allowed tomorrow also to do according to the day's edict. And let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. A decree was issued in Susa, and the ten sons of Haman were hanged. The Jews were who were in Susa gathered also on the 14th day of the month of Adar, and they killed 300 men in Susa, but they lay no hands on the plunder. Now the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives and got relief from their enemies and killed 75,000, those who hated them but 
they laid no hands on the plunder. This was on the thirteenth day of the month of Adar. On the fourteenth day they rested and made the day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews who were in Susa gathered on the thirteenth day and on the fourteenth, and rested on the fifteenth, making that day of feast and glad- gladness. Therefore the Jews of the village who live in the rural towns hold the fourteenth day of the month of Adar as a day of glad- gladness and feasting, as a holiday, and as a day on which they send gifts and food to one another. Okay. So they end in a celebration. They do. We're, we're trying to have that happy ending, but you pointed out it's not quite yes. the happy ending that our souls really are looking for because it does result in a lot of death yes. um, of their enemies. But um, one of the things that I noticed is um, they didn't celebrate. Um, the day of Purim didn't celebrate actually the war yeah. or the fighting. It celebrated the rest yeah. that they had after the fighting. And um, one of the things that I think is pretty cool to point out is um, Purim, the, mm-hmm. the celebration that resulted from um, this particular edict that they were to celebrate, um, it it actually was imposed, like it wasn't written out in God's word mm-hmm. as one of the feasts like yeah. Leviticus. I mean, Leviticus had been written before this and Leviticus spells out several feasts. So this wasn't like one of the feasts that was written out in God's word. It was a feast that the Jews imposed upon themselves. Yeah. And I was reading some commentary and the commentary pointed out that um, in chapter one, verse 19, I think it is where it talks about Haman made an irrevocable law or irrevocable edict. Yeah. Um, he irrevocably obligated Xerxes to this edict. It's actually the same exact word used to describe how the Jews obligated themselves to celebrating. Yeah. I um, mean, so it's like this reversal um, that it literally they took it upon themselves mm. to irrevocably obligate themselves to celebrate the rest that God gave them after fighting in the same way that Haman tried to irrevocably yeah. obligate their death um, but he wasn't successful yeah maybe this is a good time to kind of dive into the or should we finish um, chapter 10 before we talk about the the how that chiastic nature is working here as far as why the feasts and stuff do you think we should do that now or go do you... for it okay so um it, what you're going to see is this description as you continue on you're going to see this description of um uh, in chapter 10 as well mordecai is going to be elevated up into his greatness and his uh and in uh, return of this, we're going to see decrees being made. There's going to be two feasts that take place um, very specifically. Um, and uh, the queen and Mordecai obviously saved the Jews, Jews through all this. This is going to completely pattern the first two chapters of um, of Esther, where the king, if you remember, talks all about the king's greatness and his amazing ve- feasts. And he holds two feasts, and it leads to the, the exile, supposedly, or the, even potentially the death of of Vashti, which is going to set up um, Esther and uh, uh, Mordecai to be placed in literally within the courts of of uh, the king here, and then what you're going to see is through Esther and the and Mordecai's faithfulness, they overhear, if you recall, the the um, execution potential execution of um, uh, um, plan to kill the king, and that saves the king. So just where you're seeing this parallel of Esther and Mordecai's faithfulness and um you see that happen again here in nine and ten and they save the whole all the jews but all of this is again it's parallel par- paralleling as you it's this idea of reversals just like in the end of chapter eight you see mordecai is elevated that parallels haman's elevation in chapter three um also in chapter eight you're going to see the decree to save the jews um through mordecai it's going to be exactly paralleled with chapter three's Haman's decree to kill the Jews. Um, and it's going to talk about the Purim and the rolling of the dice. And and all of that just keeps working down in this in that A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D format, which again leads back to that the story um, where the story pivots um, uh, with Esther uh, ultimately uh, coming before the king and, and Mordecai is elevated up on the horse and uh, Haman's re- refusal to bow. Um, uh, is kind of that pivoting point. And so th- not only are we just reading about random feasts that take place and the elevation of Mordecai, but it's very, very intentional. You can lay them up um, next to each other and read how how um, it is very intentionally going down one word for word ultimately and undoing what, what was evil in the first opening chapters. Um, and now because God uh, is the one who's in control, it's all worked out for the good, you know, for those who are faithful and called according to his purpose. 
Yeah. And so, um, and you touched on this with the chiastic structure, but often Esther's referred to as the book of reversals. Because mm-hmm. like you pointed out, there's such intentional reversals of almost every mm-hmm. action. And then as we've been going through the book of Esther, we've like uncovered more and more reversals, yeah. you know, that we've noticed. Um, but yet, as you have pointed out, we're still kind of left a little unsettled. Yeah. And that the happy ending is the death of 75,800 yeah. people, you know? Um, and I think the reason that we're left hanging there is um, it, we're, lo- we need to continue to look forward to a reversal yeah. and Jesus came for that yeah. ultimate reversal because the ultimate reversal is a reversal from death to resurrection, yeah. from death to life. And, um, you know, I really had thought about that, um, earlier in a passage when I was reading about John, I told Mm. you about when I was going through the gospel of John, I was actually teaching it to the women here at church. And, um, I was studying one Sunday evening. This was actually years ago. Um, and Andrew was little at the time. My, my youngest, he's 11 now, but he was probably about three or four and we lived on a cul-de-sac. And so we often played in the front yard instead of the backyard Mm -hmm. on our cul-de-sac, um, because he could kind of safely ride his little, tricycle and the the road and things like that and so one Sunday afternoon I had set up my bag chair in the garage and pulled out my my book that I was reading and my bible and I just thought I would have some quiet time while he was occupied because that's what you do with three (laughs) and four year olds right when you want some quiet time you occupy them so he was he was occupied with his tricycle on the road and my neighbor came up and at first I was like oh I don't really want to talk to a neighbor right now (laughs) this was my quiet time but um you know one of the things I've try to be really intentional about is to be hospitable because yeah. God, God calls his people to be hospitable. And so, um, I, I offered him a bag chair and he took it and he had come over to tell me that he was going out of town, mm. um, you know, just to keep it an eye on his house. And so of course I, I gladly agreed that we would do that, but he went on to tell me the purpose of his trip. And he had explained to me that, um, he had an older daughter mm. who lived in New York and um, his daughter um, had actually been raped oh my and goodness. she was pregnant. And he went on to tell me this like really tragic story um, of the events that they had been through as a family mm. and how difficult it was and how much he wanted to kill the man who raped his daughter. Um, but she was actually giving birth um, to the baby. She had decided to keep the baby and he was traveling to New York to meet his first grandchild. Wow. And, um, I, I, t- I mentioned, you know, of course I was just in- enthralled in his story at yeah. this point. Um, and I was listening to every detail and I said, you must be so angry. Like you must have so much hate for the man who raped your daughter. And he said, yeah, but my, my suffering has given birth to Anastasia and Anastasia is mm. what the daughter chose to name the little girl that she was about to have. And God just kept like that just kept going on and on in my head, like all day. Like I was almost like God was like, that's a message for you, you know, yeah. as well. Obviously that was a very personal to him, but right. all day I just was kept thinking, God, my suffering gives birth to Anastasia. My suffering gives birth to Anastasia. So finally I just looked up the word Anastasia. It's really similar to the Greek word for resurrection. <laughs> really? Yeah. And so I think in fact, they even assign that meaning to the, the name. Um, and so I just begin to think suffering gives birth to resurrection. And what I really grabbed on through that truth that God laid on my heart that day is that God doesn't give birth to repair. God doesn't even give birth to restoration. God doesn't give birth to replacement. So he isn't um, Mm. saying, okay, well, you messed this up, so I'll give you something different. Or he doesn't say, okay, you messed this up, so I'll fix it so it's good as new. No, he brings it back to life. Mm. He is the God of ultimate reversal. And we can see that through Jesus, suffering gives birth to resurrection. Mm. And it doesn't happen yet in the book of Esther, but it is surely as sure and as certain as it's going to happen. Because just like that verb in verse one, that God absolutely turns the tables continuously, Mm. never ending, he's going to finish it. And death is going to give birth to resurrection. Mm. Death is going to give birth to life and the ultimate reversal in Jesus. Wow. What a story. Wow. What an an incredible illustration too, to kind of tie, tie most of this up, 
up together because you are you are left wanting and, and needing more needing more of a reversal because there there's plenty of reversals that take place in this story but it's it's still left at death um they're still left at destruction they're still left at um at this ultimate um payment for for the sin that that we you know commit in this world for the doing the things that we feel are right in our own eyes um and and that's one of the reasons uh, for me i i love the story of joseph i know we've kind of alluded to it a lot um in order to get the full meaning of what, what we're longing for, you have to read this the, the Esther narrative through the Joseph eyes because there's so many parallels. And when you read that Joseph narrative, the point, again, it ends in death. The same way he's left in a tomb in Egypt, in the wrong land, dead, you know, um, and, and there's no reversal that fully takes place. But up to that point, um, b- metaphorically, it, it had been, or sim- symbolically, he had been brought down into Sheol is the way that the Genesis, Genesis will put it down into the ground, down into death, what should have been certain death. Ultimately he continues to descend down into the pit. Um, and it was going through the pit, um, th- that brought new life to all of the world. The way that, again, the way that Genesis narrative will say that, well, now you get to Esther and there's a lot of parallels between what happens, but they're not in the pit. You're left longing for, um, you're you don't realize it, but you're left longing for that word that's similar to Anastasia, right? Mm-hmm. That's a word for um, the overcoming the death that that takes place. Because yes, there's a reversal here, but there's still a reversal that needs to take place fully. And it's that it's that uh, no matter how much we're elevated up, you're still in the wrong land. You're still with uh, in the in the midst of the wrong people, and you're not um, not where we belong. Ultimately, there's a chiasm, uh, a chasm that is, is separating us from from where we where we ultimately belong, um, and so it's it's a very weird um, and bittersweet ending to Esther. And I think we can end by reading um, chapter okay. ten because it's just very very long. It's my kind of chapter. <laughs> Three verses. Three verses. <laughs> um, and so I think we should end with this okay. um, with the idea of. Uh, this is amazing and God is, is, is totally in control, but just watch how you just, you're just kind of left wanting, um, still at the end, I think. Now, King Ahasuerus laid a tribute on the land and on the coastlands of the sea and all of the accomplishments of his authority and strength and the full account of the greatness of Mordecai to which the king advanced him. Are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second only to King Ahasuerus, and great among the Jews, and in favor with the multitude of his kinsmen, one who sought the good for his people, and one who spoke for the welfare of his whole nation. So there's somebody in charge here that God has put placed in control, um, and uh, he's protecting the people, even when God's name is not ever going to be mentioned in the rest of this book. And now we enter 400 years of silence. Mm-hmm. Um and again, if you look at uh, the, through that through the Joseph's eyes, we're we're left with a happy ending with the world saved, but we're left in Egypt. We're left not in the promised land. We're left not where we're supposed to be. And the very next page, of course, past Genesis is going to talk about when when a new king takes over, when a new pharaoh takes over, and it leads to enslavement and and harsher problems. And you are led through this patterning. That's just one example, but we're led through that patterning to go, okay. We can breathe at this moment. We can rest at this moment because God has put somebody in charge who's going to help, um, and he's been raised up. But what happens when he dies? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, um, and then uh, and so there's a there's this bittersweet sweet longing that okay, we keep we're brought back to rest. We're br- brought back to um, this this idea of okay, we the Jews are safe, but for how long? Because this problem will still continue, you know, yeah. into the future and into the problem or uh, into the into the um, future forever if something doesn't break that pattern completely, which necessitates, obviously, what comes in in John and in Matthew and Mark and Luke and the gospel yeah. and what Jesus will do. And in the in a way, I think that we can say that there is a happy ending, but it's not until the book of Acts. Yeah. Um, and in the book of Acts, um, you know, Jesus at the beginning of the book of Acts, he ascends back yeah. to heaven. He's already done the work on the cross. Yeah. Um, he's defeated the enemy once and for all. Um, and in the book of Acts, Peter is preaching at Pentecost. Mm. 
and and we know that three thousand people are saved. But the cool thing about Pentecost, and that was a lot. That would be a good yeah. day, right? Yeah, for it's a, a great day. Yeah, that'd be an amazing day. <laughs> but um, the cool thing um, about Pentecost is we know that the disciples were speaking um, in lots of languages. That mm-hmm. they were given the gift of languages to communicate the gospel, um, because there were so many people there. And it names the people groups there in yeah. Acts chapter two. Um, it says that um, each of them heard in their own language. Um, the Parthenians, the Medes, the Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Pagiria, Pamphylia, Egypt, districts of Libya and Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arab, Arabs, hear, each heard them in their own tongue, which is kind of reminiscent of the many tongues in the book of Esther. But on top of that, I mean, if we were to compare those lands, we would find a lot of overlapping to the Persian Empire. Interesting. Yeah. And so there is a happy ending. The happy ending is in Jesus. Yeah. The happy ending isn't in Esther. If you um, noticed, her name actually isn't even mentioned in the last chapter. Yeah. Because she isn't the hero of this story. Yeah. Mm. She can't. You know, she cannot. She isn't the god of reversals. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, Jesus brought forth the greatest and ultimate reversal mm. and death to resurrection and um and our hope should look forward to that yeah. as the people did in the book of esther or like us getting to live on this side of his work and yeah. to look back to the work that he did on the cross so what you're telling me is this cinderella story is actually just pointing to a different king absolutely i interesting. love that interesting yeah well we did it <laughs> we didn't we didn't leave all stones unturned or we left there's some stones that we did not turn over but uh i think we grasped a a greater i i've learned a lot i've learned a lot Me about too. the book of esther and i think it's a pretty fascinating book and uh, honestly what 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 sticks with me is uh is that invitation to see god at work when uh when even when we don't necessarily see it uh, right up front and in, in uh in the writing and in my own life t- today as well yeah, because even though we may not identify specifically with the events mm. in the book of Esther, we can identify with a feeling of things spinning out of control yeah. or God being silent yeah, um, or things being done to us, you know, beyond our control. Um, we need to know that the Lord ultimately yeah. is always in control and that um, he brings about his good for mm. all those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. I can't help but think about Corey Ten Boom in mm. the hiding place. Um, mm. You know, she's she wrote after the Holocaust, um, and she was a Christian who hid Jews in her home and ultimately was sent to a concentration camp mm. herself. And um, and I'm probably going to mess up the quote because I can't remember it exactly. But she she says in her book, The Hiding Place, um, and it's it's really a good one. If yeah. you haven't read it. She says that everything in our past is God preparing us for our future. Wow. Um, yeah. Actually, that's a really that's a really interesting thought to, to kind of conclude with is that um, really this is this is going to be a pattern that will be on repeat. Um, when it comes to what we would call the eschatological, like end times events, is that everything that's written in at the end of Daniel and that prophetic sense and in Revelation and in in all of this um, that points towards a time when there will be a future beastly ruler who will come and take captive and enslave ultimately the, the those who are um, followers of Christ, and then it will lead to death and destruction in all the world. And it's this it's this idea of what's happening here in Persia, you know, and in what happened in Babylon and what's happened on repeat just on a massive scale. Um, but we're given these beautiful characters like Esther and Daniel and Joseph and and the idea of like what as a follower of Christ we are called to do, except we're not left alone to do it mm-hmm. because the the gift of the Holy Spirit is there to not just give us 10 seconds of courage, but yeah. to, to, to push us in, uh, along when uh, when we seem like all hope is lost. And so, you know, I, again, I have that bittersweet feeling that I pray that that comes sooner than later because mm-hmm. I'd love to be restored back into a, a Eden on Earth kingdom of, of, of God. But uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, it's it, it doesn't leave um, a great feeling towards the that you're looking at. This is all still occurring and will occur um, at the end of the day. But at least um, we are left with that same uh, hope 
uh, that God is at work. He's yeah. not absent. He doesn't leave us to do it alone. And who knows, maybe we are called to do something at such a time as this. Yeah. Uh, just like Esther. And our hope can be assurance mm-hmm. because um, it's something that God's going to do, not yeah. something that we have to do. And it is sure and it is certain and it yeah. is finished. So maybe we can find our uh, our times of, of celebration and rest. Yeah. Uh, even in the midst of Persia. Absolutely. Well, I think uh, I think we can uh, call it call it good on on uh, on these and um, and uh, I don't know. What, what do you say? What do you think? I just uh, pray us out. I here? think you should pray. All right. Let's do that. Father God, thank you so much for another opportunity to dive into your word. Father, um, I just pray that you'll help us to, um, to to see you at work, not just in the book of Esther, but in the book of Adam, the, the book of Alice, and the, the, the chapters that you've written for us. Father, I pray that we'll remain faithful in the things that you've called us to, um, that we'll see your hands at work the whole time, that we will choose your ways and not our own ways. Father, and that we will um, rely on that hope that you've given us, a hope that that um, transcends death, that overcomes that um, that that uh, penalty that we've brought into this world, God, that, that through uh, what Jesus has done in that ultimate reversal, God, that we'll uh, one day get to uh, experience that uh, firsthand, that ultimate reversal um, of, of sin. Father, and we're thankful for that hope that you've given us. Father, I pray that you'll just be with us as we continue to um, uh, make these podcasts. I pray that they be um, what you, what's honoring and, and pleasing to you. Father, it's in your name we ask it. Amen. Amen.